the commodities market bubble, money manager capitalism, and the financialization of commodities by L. Randall Ray. Index Speculation in Commodity Futures Markets In late 2005, a friend working in financial markets told me that the Alaska Permanent Fund was considering allocating a portion of its portfolio to oil futures indexes. Recall that the purpose of this fund is to reduce Alaska's dependence on revenues from its major non-renewable resource, oil. The idea was that a portion of oil revenues would be invested in a diversified portfolio with some of, it, of the returns paid to residents in the form of an annual dividend. At that time, the fund was considering a move to put a portion of the state's oil revenues into oil futures and other commodity futures, essentially a doubling down of its bet on oil. To be sure, it was doing nothing unusual pension fund managers, university endowments, and hedge funds were all doing the same thing, investing in commodities, including oil. To understand why, one needs to know that a number of researchers had demonstrated that commodity prices are not correlated with returns from fixed income instruments, for example, bonds, and equities, stocks. Thus, holding commodities would reduce volatility in portfolio returns. Further, commodities tend to do fairly well in an inflationary environment, so adding commodities to the portfolio provides an inflation hedge. Footnote 8. For example, the California Public Employees Retirement System, CalPERS, Statement of Investment Policy issued on February 19, 2008, includes commodities as a major part of its inflation-linked asset class, which comprises 5% of its total portfolio. The allocation within the inflation-linked asset class is as follows. Commodities, 1.5%. Inflation-linked bonds, 1%. Infrastructure, 1.5%. And forest land, 1%. It obtains its positions in commodities through commodity futures that try to match the S&P GSCI Total Return Index. Note that the correlations that encouraged managed money to move into commodities could well break down by the flood of money since those correlations are obtained from a period in which flows were insignificant. Further, if a crisis follows the current boom, it is unlikely that past correlations will persist. End footnote. However, holding commodities is expensive. There are substantial storage costs in addition to the usual financing or opportunity costs involved. Hence, money managers looked to the commodity futures market. Paper claims to commodities could be held rather than the commodities themselves. Because a futures contract would expire on a specified date, the holder of the paper would then be in a position to receive the commodities. Of course, these money managers do not want to ever take shipment, so the contracts are rolled on the scheduled date into another futures contract, one with a farther off date, one with a farther off delivery date. Footnote 9. Index speculators do, do not want to receive physical commodities, so they enter into a prepackaged trade called a calendar spread. In a calendar spread, a trader simultaneous, simultaneously buys a more distant future and sells their closer to expiration future. Because many index speculators will be doing a Goldman roll at about the same time, the prices of expiring contracts are depressed, while those of the more distant future contracts are published up due to index roll congestion. This generates profits for speculators on spread trades much of which are reaped by the Wall Street banks that provide swap services. According to John Dizzard, 2007, this cost index speculators about 150 basis points of return in 2007 and generated approximately $60 billion for the firms that manage the index funds. End footnote. There are three main types of participants in commodity futures markets. 
hedgers, traditional speculators, and index speculators. Table 1 offers a useful classification of each by function, the allocation of a portion of the portfolio to commodity futures in order to, to diversify risks is undertaken by the index speculator. These are typically hedge funds, pension funds, university endowments, life insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds, and banks. Most importantly, index speculators only take long positions. It is a buy and hold strategy. To simplify allo allocation, Managed money typically buys one of the commodity futures indexes, hence the term index speculator. Footnote 10. Strictly speaking, index speculators do not buy the index, but rather outsource, the ma outsource management of their futures trading to one of the Wall Street banks, which tries to replicate one of the indexes by purchasing a basket of commodity futures contracts with the same weighting scheme as the index. It is reported that 85-90% to 90 of institutional investors enter into over-the-counter commodity index swaps with Wall Street banks. Approximately 70% of this business is handled by just four banks. Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Barclays. These four account for about a quarter of all contracts on the Commodity Futures Exchange. End footnote. The biggest are Standard & Poor's S&P, GSCI, and the Dow Jones AIG Commodity Index, D DJ AIGCI. If index prices rise, they earn returns. Indeed, because Commodity Futures contracts do not pay any yield, the only possible source of, I of return is an increase in the price of the contracts. For this reason, the purchase of a commodity futures index is fundamentally a speculative activity. Prior to the 1990s, the prudent investor rule prohibited pension plans from buying commodity futures contracts. It was the collapse of the equities market in 2000 and the discovery that the performance of commodities was not correlated with equities performance that led to a belief that futures contracts could be used to reduce portfolio risk. This is what allowed Goldman Sachs, as well as other indexers, to successfully push commodity futures as a new asset class for prudent investors. Hedgers are those with a direct interest in the physical commodities themselves. They use, futures, they use futures markets to reduce or eliminate losses due to unforeseen movements in commodity prices. Sellers of commodities take short positions agreeing to deliver the commodities on the future date. Buyers take long positions, agreeing to take physical delivery on the contract expiration date. The CFTC includes hedgers in its commercial category. However, as discussed below, the CFTC also includes swap dealers in the commercial category on the argument that at least some of these swaps are directly related to hedging commodity price risk. The traditional speculator facilitates hedging by taking the other side of the trade with hedgers. In other words, by taking the price risk the he that hedgers do not want. Traditional speculators are said to provide liquidity by increasing the volume of transactions. The CFTC classifies such speculators as non-commercial, since they have no direct interest in the physical commodities. Finally, index speculators pursue a buy-and-hold strategy using futures contracts as a portfolio diversification tool. These are, said to these are said to consume liquidity because they take only long positions, acting solely as buyers of contracts. Further, these are the only market players that are insensitive to price. They allocate a percentage of their portfolios to each commodity regardless of price. Index speculators can be included in the commercial category, even though they never take physical delivery, because they operate in the swaps market, which, as mentioned above, is counted as commercial activity. Masters and White, 2008, argue that the commodity futures market 
is the single market that brings together participants in the physicals market and speculators in financial derivatives tied to the physicals. Table 2 shows the dollar weights in the S&P GSCI and the DJ AIGCI indexes. Energy commodities dominate, with crude oil making up 51.4% of the index, and all energy-related products accounting for 78.2%. The biggest agricultural commodities weightings are given to coin, soybeans, and wheat. The largest shares for metals are in aluminum, copper, and gold. It must be emphasized that, while a 4% share assigned to a commodity might appear small, the size of managed money funds is gargantuan relative to the size of commodity futures markets. Table 8 shows estimates provided in con Congressional Testimony by Portfolio Manager Michael W. Masters, 2008A, of the quantities of commodities underlying the contracts held by managed money. For comparison purposes, Masters pointed out that between 2008 and mid-2000, be, Masters pointed out that between 2003 and mid-2008, the total increase in Chinese oil consumption was 920 million barrels, while he calculated that index speculators increased their contract holdings by 848 million barrel, barrels over the same period. In other words, the increased demand by managed money for oil futures nearly matched the increase in China's demand for actual oil. As another example, index speculators hold contracts for over 1.3 million tons of copper out of a total annual production of less than 18 million tons. Between 2002 and 2007, China's reported increase in demand for copper was about 2 million tons. Note the caveat above. Veneroso believes that much of this flowed into hidden inventories. By comparison, the demand for copper futures contracts by index speculators was just under 1.2 million tons. Indeed, index speculators now hold contracts that exceed the annual production of all U.S. copper mines. The United States is the world's number two producer. Wheat futures that are sufficient to meet America's demand for wheat for two years, and contracts on enough corn to supply the U.S. ethanol industry for one year. A useful way of assessing the impact of index speculation on commodity markets is to examine open interest. This is a measure of the dollar value of positions in commodity futures contracts that are held overnight excluding the ebbs and flows of intraday price moves. The final two columns of Table 3 show open interest for 2002 and 2008. Over that period, the dollar value of contracts swelled by a factor of more than 9. Obviously, many orders of magnitude greater than the growth in demand for the underlying commodities. In a separate calculation, Masters and White 2008 estimate that the total volume of futures contracts purchased between January 1, 2003 and mid-March 2008 has increased by about 5 million, of which index speculators bought 2.7 million, or just over half. By contrast, physical hedgers produced one-fifth. It is hard to avoid the conclusion that the index speculator tail is wagging the physical hedger dog when it comes to commodity futures contracts. However, comparing the volume and price of futures contracts purchased and the available supply of the physical commodities might appear to be a comparison of apples and oranges. After all, the pension fund that buys futures contracts is not actually going to take delivery of the oil. What is important is that once a fund has decided to allocate, say, 5% of its investments to commodity futures. It stays in the commodities. As the total portfolio grows, the fund continues to increase its holdings of commodity futures indexes in order to hit its allocation target. As this strategy caught on, huge volumes of money flowed into the indexes and thus into the commodity futures market.
into the commodity futures markets. In 2004, there was a total of about $50 billion in the, end in the indexes, growing to above $100 billion in 2006 and to above $300 billion in July 2008. In the first 52 trading days of 2008, $55 billion of managed money from pension funds, university endowments, banks, and sovereign wealth funds poured into commodity futures markets, pursuing the buy-and-hold strategy. Making the case that these inflows of funds have driven the price of commodity futures even higher seems easy enough. Most expositions begin with a figure plotting commodity prices against commodity futures investments. For example, figure 3. Note that here I have plotted the spot price of the S&P GSCI index, an index that reflects the current market price of 25 basic commodities. Footnote 11. As we will see, the spot price reflected in the index is actually based on the futures contract price for the commodities, including the index. End footnote. This is because the concern is whether activity in futures markets is impacting today's commodity, pricer, commodity prices. Further, as shown in Figure 5, Spot and future prices closely track one another. See page 33. Figure 4 plots swap dealers' long positions in NYMEX crude oil fixed futures against the price of crude. Recall that most index speculators use swap dealers to replicate one of the commodity indexes, and as the quantity of managed money allocated to commodities increases, the number of contracts bought by swap dealers grows. Again, the correlation is strong. As swap dealers purchase more contracts, the price of oil rises. The picture seems clear. The match between the flow of managed money into futures markets and the spot price of commodities is remarkable. Higher money inflows lead to higher prices. However, as many economists would warn, Correlation never proves causation. And indeed, the causation must go at least both ways. Rising prices encourage more inflows, and more inflows generate higher prices. But even with that caveat, the evidence appears at least superficially quite strong, and worthy of a call on Washington to do something about this speculative to do something about this speculatively driven up, driven run up in commodity prices. But even with that caveat, the evidence appears at least superficially quite strong, and worthy of a call on Washington to do something about this speculatively driven run up on in commodity prices. Again, the economist would urge caution. Futures markets play two essential roles. The first is to enable buyers and sellers to hedge price risk. A farmer can contract to deliver wheat at harvest at a locked-in price, secure in the knowledge that, should prices fall before that date, the farmer will receive the contracted price. At the same time, a commercial bakery that wants to buy wheat at harvest can use a futures contract to hedge against the possibility that prices will rise. The problem is that the number of offers by farmers to sell at harvest will tend to exceed the number of bids by those who want to contract for delivery at harvest, for a variety of reasons. This results in a bid-ask spread. The difference between the price buyers are willing to pay for future wheat and the price at which sellers are willing to sell future wheat. An intermediary or a traditional speculator can step in to lower the spread, essentially making a bet on whether prices are likely to rise, closer to the ask price, or to fall toward the bid price. This role can be played by local traders and day traders who go long by agreeing to take delivery of wheat on the contracted date on the expectation of selling 
the physical delivery contracts to the end users of the grain at a higher price than they paid for the contracts. In this manner, speculators lower the spread and are said to provide liquidity to the market since they reduce costs. Such behavior is a common and necessary feature of all markets that have forward-looking contracts. The fear is that if government intervenes to constrain su such speculation, it will reduce the liquidity that makes mar futures markets operate more efficiently. Bid-ask spreads will widen, market costs will be higher, and fewer futures contracts will be completed, and buyer and sellers of commodities will not be able to hedge price risk as desired. Thus, government should not constrain speculation. The second role played by futures markets is said to be price discovery. Commodities production is often local, while final consumption is more geographically dispersed. For example, wheat is, harv wheat is farmed in several distinct rural regions in the United States, with the ultimate consumers of wheat more than a thousand miles away. Farmers might sell to local grain elevator owners who act as intermediaries. Neither the farmer nor the grain elevator owner has a lot of information about the price that the grain might ultimately fetch when sold to the food processing industry. However, unlike the local market for the physical commodity, the commodity futures market is national and even international. Futures prices are readily available and reflect real-time supply and demand. Thus, local physical commodity markets have come to rely on futures markets as the primary source of price information on the national and international markets. There is then an adjustment that is made to reflect local conditions, much as the Kelly Blue Book adjusts used car values to reflect local market conditions by zip code. The use of commodity futures markets has eliminated the sometimes large differences between prices in various regional spot markets that existed prior to the 1980s. Now, as the CFTC describes it, in Quote, in many physical commodities, especially agricultural commodities, cash market participants base spot and forward prices on the futures prices that are discovered in the competitive open auction market for a futures exchange. End quote. Footnote 12. Not all commodities are priced this way. This description applies to wheat, coin, and corn and soybeans in agriculture, and to WTI crude oil, heat heating oil, gasoline, and natural gas in the energy sector. However, other commodities are priced relative to these. For example, coal is priced relative to oil. For this reason, prices in futures markets tend to affect spot prices across a range of commodities. See Masters 2008b pages 3 to 4. End footnote. Describing oil pricing, Platts, the biggest pricing service for the en energy industry, writes, quote, In the spot market, therefore, negotiations for physical oils will typically use NYMEX as a reference point, with bids, offers, and deals expressed as a differential to the futures price. Using these differentials, Platts makes daily and in some cases intraday assessments of the price of, for various physical grades of crude oil, which may be referenced in other spot, term, or derivatives deals. End quote. Ironically, even the S&P, GSCI, and the DJAIGCI spot price commodity indexes are actually based predominantly upon the prices to of the nearest to expiration futures contracts for their respective set commodities. Finally, Masters 2008b emphasizes the point, quote, in the present system, price changes for key agricultural and energy commodities originate in the futures markets and then are transmitted directly 
to the spot markets. End quote. This is not what is usually taught in economics textbooks. According to traditional theory, fundamentals determine spot prices through the forces of supply and demand, as discussed above. Futures prices are then equal to spot prices plus the cost of carry less convenience yield. The costs of carry include warehousing fees and foregone interest on money that is tied up in the contract. The convenience yield includes income that could be earned by using the commodity until the contract date. Normally, if supply and demand for future delivery are in balance, then the futures price should exceed the spot price because carrying costs are greater than convenience yields. A contango exists in this case. The futures price is higher than the spot price, which contracts priced higher the farther out the expiration date. However, following John Maynard Keynes's seminal contributions to our textbook understanding of finance, this is not the case in most commodity markets, since commodity producers seeking to secure the price at which they will be able to sell their output tend to outnumber buyers seeking to lock in the future price at which they will purchase. Thus, the supply of futures contracts offered by commercial hedgers will exceed the demand, leading to futures prices that are below cash prices, what Keynes called the natural, backward the natural backwardation of commodity futures markets. It is usually the case that when there is a shortage in supply or an excess or, or an excess speculative demand, this is first evidence in the spot market, driving cash prices above futures, futures prices. This can occur if there has been an attempt to corner the market by buying up the physical supplies so that those who have sold futures must purchase at an excessive price to obtain the physical commodity. This is what happened in the Hunt Brothers attempt to corner silver. It can also occur if there is a belief that there will be supply shortages and users seek to hoard supplies, as occurs in most famines. Here, the increasing spot price creates a backwardation that feeds into the futures price. Indeed, virtually all the prior experiences of commodity booms have been characterized by this configuration. However, in the current price run-up, the opposite has been the case as futures typically have traded above spot, suggesting dominance of the market by speculative demand. For anyone seeking to buy the physical commodity, there is always the choice between buying in the spot cash market and buying a future that is at maturity and taking delivery. This means that no one would ever pay more than the current spot price for a maturing futures contract, since they both provide the same thing spot delivery of the physical commodity. This is called the convergence of futures to spot prices. This no arbitrage condition has been used by many to claim that it is the spot price that determines the futures price, since the latter converges to the former. But it is easy to see that this conclusion is unwarranted, as the futures price converges to the spot price only upon maturity of the contract. During the three-month life of the contract, the futures price is free to vary with market conditions, as does the spot price. At maturity, it may be higher or lower than at the origination of the contract, yet still satisfy convergence. Further, each month there will be a new futures contract, and many speculators make spread trades that involve selling a nearer-term futures contract and buying one for a longer term. In addition, as discussed above, index funds that do not want to take delivery of their maturing contracts will roll over their positions, selling the near-maturity contract and buying, usually a larger amount of, the next maturity or a longer one. This will mean that as older contracts mature, younger futures contracts will have come into existence with higher prices, and those who
who have sold contracts will see that they could have waited to sell at a higher price. The expectation of continually rising futures prices thus creates an incentive to hold physical supplies off the spot market. Those who are receiving physical supplies have an incentive to roll them over into futures contracts with a later maturity date, both acting to drive up spot prices in the wake of rising futures prices. This tends to create a price series for forward futures contracts that resembles the yield curve on bonds, and with rising futures prices, this curve has a positive slope associated with a contango. Thus, one test of the impact of futures speculation on current prices has been the existence of a positively sloped futures curve. Results of statistical tests have been inconclusive but this is not surprising, given the fact that the available data consists only of the reports provided to the CFTC, which, as noted above, does not include trading on either ICE or proprietary over-the-counter electronic systems. Nonetheless, most prior commodity price booms have been characterized by backwardation, while the present boom has been dominated by contango. This is not proof of speculation, but there is certainly consistent but it is con certainly consistent with the result that would be expected in a market dominated by flows of managed money from index speculators. Krugman and others like the supply and demand story, but it Krugman and others like the supply and demand story but it doesn't work that way in many commodity markets. As previously discussed, many commodity markets, as previously discussed, many commodity prices have always been administered by oligopolists or oligopsonists, or oligopsonists, rather than set by the impersonal forces of supply and demand in perfectly competitive markets. Further, as market participants and those who operate and regulate futures exchanges describe, spot prices are set with reference to futures prices. This means that market fundamentals and the forces of supply and demand cannot be the sole determinants of the spot price. If spot prices are set through reference to futures prices, then Anything that affects futures can directly impact the spot market. Indeed, as Figure 5 shows, there is very little divergence between crude oil spot prices and futures prices. More discussion of the figure follows. While the traditional story that spot and futures prices must converge upon expiration of the contract is correct, this does not necessarily mean that it is future prices that must do the converging. Spot prices can rise, or fall, to meet futures prices, and they can do so immediately. Finally, while finance theory teaches that contango is the natural relation, future prices are greater than spot prices in order to cover carrying costs. The discussion above led to the conclusion that backwardation is normal for many commodities because producers who want to sell dominate the market so the future price should be below the spot price, rising over the life of the contract to converge with the spot price. This creates an incentive for speculators to buy the futures contracts, taking long positions, promising later delivery from producers. Kriegel, 2008. Predominance of a contango can indicate a speculative market. The demand for futures contracts is spurred by a belief that spot, ri spot prices will rise. If spot prices are set in reference to futures, a speculative boom is triggered because the rising spot market validates the expectations and thereby fuels greater demand for futures contracts. Figure 5 is shaded to indicate periods of contango in crude oil prices. From late 2004 through mid-2007, oil was in contango possibly indicating a speculative boom. 
It is also possible evidence of, a, of an expected future oil shortage, which could be the cause of speculation in futures contracts. Or it could be due to a flow of managed money into futures markets, as discussed above. The timing does appear to be about correct. The flow of managed money into commodity futures indexes grew from 2004 through 2007, coinciding with the contango in oil, the commodity that has the largest weighting in the indexes. This is also the period in which the price of oil futures began to grow very quickly. Let us review the claim that index speculators have driven the spot prices of commodities to historic levels. Commodities markets deviate substantially from the perfectly competitive model with substantial evidence that prices are administered rather than set by fundamental forces of supply and demand. In many cases, spot prices are determined directly by the price of futures. In others, they are determined by expectations for future spot prices, which are generated by commodity futures prices, and an adjustment to reflect local market conditions. A markup or markdown over the prices quoted on near-date futures contracts. Futures prices, in turn, are influenced by a variety of forces, including attempts by buyers and sellers to hedge price risk, by traditional speculators to go short or long as they make guesses about price movements, and by index speculators diversifying portfolios into a new asset class, commodities. It is no coincidence that futures prices soared over the past four years, as huge sums of managed money from pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, hedge funds, university endowments, and banks, mostly European, flowed into futures markets. This reinforced other factors that had been driving up prices, including rapid growth in China and India, as well as some supply constraints and inventory manipulation. Government policies, including export restrictions and U.S. biofuel incentives, also played a role. These policy choices were themselves prodded by rising commodity prices, even as they contributed to rising prices. A perfect storm was created, one in which almost every participant's interest lay in continued, in continued price gains. Many participants in and observers of commodity futures markets have argued that index speculation has contributed significantly to rising spot prices. Douglas Steenland, 2008, President and CEO of Northwest Airlines, provided testimony before the House of Representatives that reflected the beliefs of many in the airlines industry. See also Fornaro et al., 2008. The total annual cost of jet fuel for the industry is projected to increase by 50% over 2007 to $60 billion. The industry believes that the Enron and London loopholes that exempted a huge swath of the futures markets from CFTC regulation allowed a surge of pension and other passive investment funds into commodity markets. Footnote 13. The so-called London loophole refers to the CFTC's decision in 1999 to allow traders using the London exchanges to avoid position limits to which U.S. exchanges were, subje were subject. ICE has taken advantage of this. The Enron loophole, which dates to 2000, exempts electronic trading from U.S. regulation. Its namesake used the exemption to corner the market for California's supply of electricity. End footnote. Steenland pointed out that in March 2008, 1.2 billion, bi billion barrels of oil were traded every day on NYMEX and the London Intercontinental Exchange. With world consumption of oil at only 87 million barrels a day. Speculators hold about two thirds of the oil contracts, up from about a fifth to 20 years ago. A barrel of oil might be traded 20 times before it is delivered to the end user. The airlines believe that speculation adds 30 to 60 dollars 
to the to the per barrel price. Tyson Foods 2008 has also been vocal in its belief that speculators are driving up the price of agricultural commodities, hence increasing the cost of producing poultry. Long only indexers hold contracts equal to 33 to 65 percent of the corn, soybean, and wheat crops. Greenwich Associates 2008 concludes that the entry of new financial or speculative investors into global commodities markets is fueling the dramatic run-up in prices. These include pension funds that use commodities to diversify portfolios, European banks that use commodity derivatives to structure retail products sold to customers, and hedge funds that use commodities as a source of alpha. Mike Masters, in testimony before Senate and Housing Committees, has made the most convincing case for a large impact coming from index speculation. A number of rebuttals to his remarks have been attempted. Perhaps the strongest counterattack was launched by NIMAC staff. First, they argue that Masters overstates the importance of speculators in commodity futures markets, NIMAX 2008. Without going deeply into details, the data provided by the CFTC does not make it possible to clearly distinguish among types of market participants. The CFTC uses only three categories. Commercial, historically about 50%, non-commercial, 35 to 40%, and unreported, 5 to 10%. Commercial participants are supposed to be those that have an association with the physical market. For example, the price hedging producers and buyers. This category is supposed to exclude speculators. However, the CFTC includes in the commercial category swap dealers, which are banks that provide over-the-counter derivatives. The reasoning is that bank customers with direct links to risks in the physicals markets can use these derivatives for hedging. However, there is nothing to prevent the banks from providing these services to those with no links to physicals. Indeed, index speculators also use the swap dealers that are counted as commercial participants. Hence, many commercial purchases are as speculators of one type or another. The non-commercial category is supposed to comprise the speculators, those with no direct interest in the physical commodities, but that number is undercounted because swap dealers are excluded. Figure 6 allocates non-reportables to the non-commercial category and separates swap dealers from the commercial category. Note that at the time, NYMEX offered its rebuttal. The discussion centered on the April 2008 graphic. If swap dealers are largely speculators, then they could be added to non-commercials, bringing the April total to about 80% of the commodity futures markets. That is one basis for the claim that speculation dominates. However, according to NYMEX, that number is far too high, because there is no basis for assuming that a large percentage of the non-reportables and swap dealers are speculating. Further, NYMEX 2008 testified that the CFTC was undertaking a revision of its data that would rebut the, the claim that speculators dominate by reclassifying market participants. Ironically, on August 5th, the CFTC did release revised data that boosted the proportion of contracts held by the non-commercial sector on July 15th by an astounding 25% to 48% of the market, as shown above. In other words, the CFTC revision accomplished precisely the opposite of what was expected by NYMEX. Since this still excludes the swap dealers, there is now little question that a large majority of positions hel are held by speculators. What was more shocking, this adjustment resulted from reclassifying just one trader, VTOL, which controls 10% of the entire oil futures market. This jolted markets because not only did it reveal that speculators dominate, but it also opened the possibility 
that positions held by just one trader could move the market. This particular trader appears to be a traditional speculator, one who holds shorts and longs, not an index speculator holding long-only positions. However, this is not a great comfort, because with positions so large, market manipulation looks like a possibility. NYMEX also attempted to argue that price determination runs from fundamentals to futures prices, with the latter converging toward spot prices determined by the laws of supply and demand. We dealt with this argument above. There is no dispute that, over time, prices must, must converge, but this does not tell us anything about price determination. When NYMEX 2008 claims that the futures market is a derivative of the physical market, not the reverse. It is speaking of some idealized market that might have existed in the distant past, but not of today's financialized commodities market. It is certainly true that oil cannot be sold at, at $125 a barrel unless someone is willing to pay that price. But that tells us nothing about the price that would be obtained in a perfectly competitive market by the forces of supply and demand. With supply coming from many producers and demand directly from users. In reality, supply is largely controlled to hit price and the demand from end users is su supplemented by the demand from arbitra arbitra arbitragers, manipulators, hedgers, speculators, and index investors with much more money to put into play. Even the major oil producing service, Platts, argues that spot prices are set with reference to NYMEX futures prices, a point also made by the CFTC, when it argues that one of the two essential services played by futures markets is price discovery. Finally, Philip McBride Johnson former chairman of the CFTC under President Reagan, flatly rejects the current chairman's claim that fundamentals are driving the boom. Quote, the fact that prices have been relentlessly trending up suggests a new type of market participant with a mentality that is traditionally more in line with investing in securities than trading in commodities. If enough of these wealthy people or funds or other entities with a load of capital decide to flip out of securities for a little while and go into commodities, and they're all looking for something that is going up, and you get enough billions of dollars thinking that way, then their wish comes true." End quote. Echos, 2008, says flatly, quote, Since there is no reason based on current and expected supply and demand that justifies the current price of oil, what is left? The oil price is a speculative bubble. End quote. This suspicion seems to be validated by the falling oil prices that followed congressional hearings into speculation, which may have slowed the flow of managed money into futures contracts since July 2008.